Try to make up, it's too late. Do you know how late, Stiller? So late, it's early. All the Welsh and Welching stars about to slide shut like the top of a spice tin, except for that one. That's a sick star, Cat. I'll tell you how you can tell. It's shining brighter than all the other stars. It's about to explode. It's cold down here on the beach. As a witch's tint. You be sure to take out insurance before you get on the plane. I have insurance. My poems will bring in an income for years. Two shillings, rain or shine. Nobody asked you to marry a penniless poet. Somebody must have. It isn't the kind of thing I could have dreamt up all by myself. What have you got on under that cheap imitation dog's fur? <laughs> in February, you're out of season. Go up and change. I won't. You will? I'll do as I bloody please. The only little pleasure I get anymore is to put this on and parade around the boathouse, imagining myself to be married to a man who could afford to take me to a warm climate. Like to hell? Or Majorca. Oh, you're very grand. I can buy it very naturally. Naturally. Yes, your father was a friend of Augustus John. Here we are go again. Who's had precious few intimates and he's a very famous man? Or the whole world knows who Augustus John is and his remarkable portraits fetched for a fancy price and still do to this day. I can't help it if an ignorant civilization sets more store by a painted patch of pocky canvas than it does by a singing heart. I'll come off better than he will in a thousand years. It takes too long. Look at the Bible. Look at the pyramids. You look at the pyramids. I look at the Bible. Nobody in Wales, nobody in your hometown here even knows who you are. How do you ask for me? I go about saying, who here knows my husband, Dylan Thomas, the poet? <sighs> well, no wonder. I'm not known as the poet. In my hometown, I'm known as the drunk. It's my principal ambition. What do you want to be when you grow up, young Dolan? My father would say to me, and I would say to my father, Daddy, I want to be the drunkest man in the world. <laughs> it's the thing you do best. Where were you all night? Your last night home, you scum. You know very well where I was. You might have joined me. I was at Brown's Hotel, having a quiet brew or two in Ivy Williams' pub, enjoying your absence and the company of a few of my earthly friends, real people, people who dig ditches, fishermen, whores, the kind of people Christ used to pal about with. I suppose you entertained a lot of them describing the battle royal we had in the afternoon. Not at all. Why should it have come up? Though I must admit they did find it middling strange that just as her dear husband's embarking on a distant journey to America, a wife wants no part of his last legal, lust, legitimate offer to pin her down flat and happy on her flip-flop vernacular. Not in the afternoon. We always used to do it in the afternoon. It's not proper. Why not? A lady does it at night. Or blindfolded. Oh. So you spent the last 12 hours discussing our private sex life with whores and fishermen, I did you? I wasn't discussing our private sex life. I was using the third person all the way. I was referring to it along the lines of why would a woman went to a man after too many goddamn years and after three children... Four, counting you. <laughs> well, I never once let on that it was my own story. Isn't the tip of your nose frostbit? The tip of something of mine is. Let's go to bed. I'd rather die first, you scum. You say you scum once more, I'll kick you right in the teeth. I know why you're all up in arms, or not up in my arms. Not up and down in my Stop seesaw. Singing. It's my going away tomorrow. Or today, I should say, to be accurate. Dylan? If you go to America tomorrow, I'll never go to bed with you again. Ah, 
Don't make threats you can't possibly keep, Cat. You know how not to be denied I am. Not in the morning, not in the afternoon, and not at night. Because all the college girls in America are whores. You'll get syphilis right on the campus. Driven to it by sexual neglect. They wear bobby socks and no panties. Uh, what do you mean that? Read Faulkner. Read Thomas Wolfe. <laughs> oh, you read too bloody much. So all the money we're going to make is meaningless, suddenly. Six months solid lecture tour bookings. You won't come home with a penny. I will come home with a penny. I'll be being wined and dined. I'm going to be patronized. You'll drink too much there. I can't. I've got to get up on a lecture platform almost every evening and read my stuff. I can't do that stinking, can I? Well, if I do, they'll spot it and I'll be packed off within a week. We've got nothing to lose and the world to gain. We won the American sweepstakes! <laughs> you only want to get away from home. You're a selfish brute. You don't give a fecking damn about me. You go off, scot-free, abandoning me, trapped in this ugly, dull, ice-cold, bourgeois, buggy little seaside cesspool next door to your father and your mother who cringe if I whistle. It's not your whistling that makes them cringe. It's your entertaining seven truck drivers when I was in London last with nothing between their popped eyes and your pale white body but a black lace slip with sequins on it. Well, I have to have some fun. <laughs> Just like you when you trot off leaving me glued night and day to three Dylan-aping, time-sucking brats. And where's me? Where's my personal self in all this? I mean, whatever became of Miss Catelyn McNamara of Dublin's fair city? I was very good at all the arts, and I never went on with any of it in the years to shot by, and here I am. To look forward to six months without my husband, without money, without help. You've got help? The help we have is no help at all. I have to help her. Well, then fire her, damn it. I can't fire her, Dylan. We owe her six months back wages. Well, if you wouldn't push her down the stairs like you did twice last week, she might be more helpful. They might be pushed down the stairs. Who's they? The help. God damn, that's snotty as hell. I don't care. I don't give a damn about anything. I'm all alone and I'm trapped. I should have been a man. How much time is there left us? I've got to catch a seven o'clock train to London in time for my flight. My rival. My rival, the whole nation of America. No time to think about romantic twaddle now. All I can think about is money. Like every other poet since time began. I tell you, I must be growing up or something. I don't like it. I'm scared. I'm scared to the bone. I used to look like some fucking angel or something back in my cherubim twenties. It all came easier and went easier. The beer went down easier. It was easier breathing. I've got uglier now. The callus on my finger is as big as an egg. Stained cigarettes. From writing, from hack work, travel logs. I haven't written a new poem in a terribly long time. Take that last BBC broadcast I did. You know, Cat, I was suddenly aware that there I was reading the best of me. It was all 15-year-old stuff. If I don't write a new poem soon, I'll die of boredom, of I don't know. Rage. I don't care if we starve, then. Don't go there. Don't go to America, Dylan. You should be sitting up there in the shack working on new poems. That's what you do. They'll turn you into a performer. They'll make you into a clown for their interviews and buy your so available soul with paper money. I mean, Ford Motors and DuPont, the United States Marine Corps, all those monopolies. I love Monopoly. It's my favorite game of chance. But I've got to grow up to get to play it on the big boys' board. 
I've got to make a living some day. What are Llewellyn and Iron and Colum to think of their dandy father if I can't put them three through college like a father's supposed to? I'm their only father, for Christ's sakes. I'm somebody's provident daddy. I can't go about playing bully boy poet till the hair in my nostrils and ears have gone grey. And what else am I fitted for in Wales, in England, to be poor and famous as a wunderkind? Some kind of Celtic nut? It's high time I acted my chronological age. I am a man, 38 years old. I'd better be a man of letters by 40 or else go work as a bartender, something I know about. John Malcolm Bringen writes that I am a legend in America, that I'm taught in classrooms. He says I'm an influence, and they're all as rich as Croesus there. Why, like Texas sophomores who memorized me 15 years ago have shot their fathers in saloons and taken over the oil wells by now. He writes that they are perishing to see me in the flesh. Well, they are going to pay to see me in the flesh and by the pound. A teaching position at a university, a sinecure. Miami Beach University, where you can get out in the sun in that vulgar G-string, get those three brats out in the sun and bake the perennial flu out of them. Don't stop me. Don't stop me, cat. You wait and see, you're going to be proud of me. We are going to be rich with respect, like adults. Live sensibly, cut down on the liquor a lot. I can't write when I drink. Well, what do you say? Optimism just pinched your ass. Why don't you smile? It would be worth losing you, even for six months, if we really could lift our heads and see daylight at last. Now you're talking, Cat, right? America. America is our salvation. Do you really think it can work? I do. We'll bank it this time, so help me God. Mr. Thomas, mm. won't you say the poem you wrote for me the week we married? <laughs> what a fantasy. I only finished it that week. I began it nearly a year before that. I didn't write anything the week we were married, and damn little since. Well, then forget it. No, I'll do it. I can use the practice for my American audiences so it won't be a total loss. You know, for a sensitive man, you're a hateful, rotten, insensitive son of a bitch. You ever wear that fucking bikini out of the house again? I'll make it black and blue for a month. You talk about growing up in one breath, and you still don't know how to blow your nose, you scum. Shut up. Shut up yourself! Now let me see. It begins. Now as I was young and easy under the apple boughs about the lilting house and happy as the grass was green. The night above the dingle starry. Time let me hail and climb golden in the heydays of his eyes. And honored among wagons I was prince of the apple towns. And once below a time I'd lordly had the trees and leaves trail with daisies and barley down the rivers of the windfall light. And as I was green and carefree, famous among the barns about the happy yard and singing as the farm was home, and the sun that is young once only, Time let me play and be golden in the mercy of his means. And green and golden I was huntsman and herdsman. The calves sang to my horn. The foxes on the hills barked clear and cold. And the Sabbath rang slowly in the pebbles of the holy streams. So beautiful. Beautiful girl. Oh, Cat, if you love the talent, then you've got to love the opportunity that's about to come true for it. I'm so afraid they'll change you, Dylan. Never. My personality's tattooed. It won't come off. They'll try. I love you the way you are. Stubborn and funny and rough, your Dylan, down to your boots. We'll have to ask to be held. Come here. 
Come here, get in there with the fats cooking that'll keep you warm. What a bright day it's going to be. It is. You can see miles out into the estuary already. Can you? You be sure to go to a dentist. The second you land in New York, you'll be a toothless lion before you're 40. Will you love me as a toothless lion? I have no pride in you, Dylan. Just emotional attachment. I don't think there's any end to it. Oh, Kat. Kat, you're the only girl for me. The only girl I'll ever love until the day I explode and go out like a light. Hurry up. international spies and Presbyterians. How do you like it in America? Wonderful! You're all living in a dream. I wouldn't wake you for the world. But do you believe in God? I'd be a damn fool if I didn't. How about Freud? How about Freud? Whatever is hidden should be made naked, brought to light, to clarity. Oh, speaking of clarity, uh, some of us, Dylan, uh, have had trouble understanding your poems. Then you should read Robert Frost. I understand you're going to be here six months. How's your wife feel about that? Dear Catelyn, quaint, quiet woman, never ventures an opinion. Did you get to see the New York skyline from the plane? I did, I did. Of course, it's all a mistake, but it's too late for any of us to do anything about it now. Let's go have a skip <laughs> drink on the boily boy. Somebody bring cash. Somebody find a pub. Somebody get my luggage. It's too string-tied, tongue-tied bags of thin high hideous to see. Malcolm Brennan is due to pick me up. The late John Malcolm Brennan. Uh, not dead, but tardy. He'll reimburse you all. It's out of my pocket. He's the Irish director of the Jewish Poetry Center and has just begun to import oh. Welsh poets, which is a hobby he may live to regret. Oh, what decided you to come to America, Dylan? To continue my lifelong search for naked women in wet Macintoshes. Uh -huh. Who has a cigar? I do. I'm uh, John Malcolm Brennan. Brennan, thank God you're here. You're just in time. I'm terribly inarticulate when it comes to interviews. Oh, did you bring him oh, We'll get him in the bar. High eyed Get him fried. Better yet. Let's go. Bring out the gin. Look out, New York. Our annual wild Welsh poet just breezed in. Come on, I'll buy you a drink. <laughs> Check it with me. I'm doing that right now. Is that all right with you? 
Mr. President? Quite all right, Mr. Marius. You know, <laughs> I don't mind checking with you if you're going to be in charge like a person who's in charge. But if you're going to lose the fort that you imported out of the RCA building, I don't see why I have to check anything with you. I'm not his mother, Angus. Well, prove it. You assume the position of being responsible for him. You can't suddenly throw him out to his own devices. Are you his man here, or aren't you? Well, I guess I am, in a sense. You better be. Just telling everybody he meets you are. I introduced him to Myra Coots, and the first thing he when? said to you Myra... When? You just told me you hadn't had a chance to see him yet. Well, I ran into him in the village two days ago. So, that's where he's been? With you and your endless string of sluts! That's a forest fire! You want it to behave like your cigarette lamp! Don't you realize, Angus, that if Dylan doesn't turn in a solid, decent performance at the Y Tuesday, then the whole tour's over? Every university I've set up for him will have a spy there. And if Dylan's looped or pooped or dull or inaudible, the cancellations will pour in in the morning. He's broke, Angus. He needs money. And I tell you, Dylan's reputation for irresponsible behavior is very living legend. So I found myself elected. Self-elected is right. I could have arranged a piddling tour of some dozen campuses as easily as you. I could have gotten Saul Hurok to book him. The whole affair is amateur night. I intend to try my damnedest to make him a big success and a little money here in America, and I only ask that you leave him alone until after his first reading, just so my piddling tour can at least have a chance to piddle. Above and beyond that, I am not my brother's keeper. That forest fire, that hangover there is just a frightened child of 38. The oldest man alive. How about lovable bastard? Can we agree to that? Now you're talking. That's me, by God, a lovable bastard. And the nicest fella you'd ever want to meet. How much of our conversation, Dylan, did you lie there listening to? Does a forest fire have ears? <laughs> uh, you're due at one o'clock at a luncheon. Absolutely. I I'm already dressed. But I don't want to miss breakfast. Call room service. I'll have a double bourbon with a raw egg in it. <laughs> for all of us here to meet you this afternoon. Not at all, madam. Your impressions of New York are so lusty and significant. <laughs> Just the customary awe of any country boy come to the big city. Well, we will all be there on Tuesday at the reading with our tickets clutched in our hot little hands. Goody. Now, you've told us what you think about America and poetry and God. What do you think about the greater New York chapter of the American National Poetry Appreciation Center? Madam, the creamed chicken was more than swell. The punch has left me wordless. And you are not to be believed. But I believe you. Believe you me. <laughs> This is the White Horse Tavern. Oh. The horse, Dylan calls it. Oh. <laughs> Let me see if he's been in one. All the drive off the Martini the Twist, Mr. Morris has a scotch on the rocks, and she'll have a pink lady. Oh, that's my drink. Ah, when I was at Smith, there was a girl just like you, and it was her drink. It's a very sweet, sweet, sweet drink, I hear. Yes, it is. Yes. No, he hasn't pulled in yet. Are you so sure he'll want liquor before tonight's performance? The Las Vegas odds, my dear Meg. I see. Then we're in for a disaster. I may not go. It won't be dull. That's a promise. That's Dylan's sacred word to the world. That's the only word he keeps. It won't be dull. Annabelle, what is that? The goddamn thing's got a pink lady. <laughs> It's quite sweet, isn't it? It's very sweet, Angus. Just like me. <laughs> Listen, I think you're sweet. You know how sweet I think you are. Oh, Angus, you're too much. <laughs> Annabelle, is your father working on a new novel? No saying novel, just keeps coming out under different titles. <laughs> mm -hmm. And what does he think of Dylan's poetry? Words, 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 he says. He thinks Dylan's a bum, but he said the same thing about every one of my mothers. <laughs> Won't you be surprised if he finds out that I've become Dylan's mistress? Oh, when did that happen? 
as soon as I meet him. Mm -hmm. And how will your father find out, dear? I'm gonna shout it from the housetops. I'm a very free, compulsive person. I have no sense of shame. I'm amoral. <laughs> Maybe Mr. Thomas won't want you. Oh, yes, he will. I heard he's not at all fussy. Don't glare at me. I simply promised Annabelle she could meet him no more than I promised you. I'm really going to stop introducing people to people. The minute they meet, they go off and leave me anyway. Don't you want to sleep with Dylan Thomas? No, you don't. With a married drunk, why should I? But he's a great poet. Angus says he is. I can't wait to see him in action tonight. They say the sound of his voice is like an organ. Holy, holy, holy. Well, all I can say is I'm available as hell for doing. Hi. Oh, hi there. Maybe you'll get a good one to marry you. Who are you kidding? I'm going to be the mistress of ten great poets, and then I'm going to marry a manufacturer and see what's cooking in Rye, New York. Go ahead and laugh. The reason I'll tell you to make out what genius is is because they all drink. They want to die young. Somebody told me it was the good housekeeping seal of approval, and I couldn't last any camp following around to bars every night. I'm famous for my hollow leg. Are you? I'm a bottomless pit. With a pitiless bottom. Oh, oh, there he is, just like his photographs. Maddox with him, very fine for Robert Maddox. <laughs> One for a seat. <laughs> oh, you fight. I retired from the race. Maddox broke his leg. I'm drunk. <laughs> <laughs> Is it true you married your sister? I had a brother. Oh. I never had a sister. Even worse. <laughs> <laughs> Gentlemen, Meg Stewart and Annabelle Graham Pfeiffer. The mainstay of the American Book Club is only child. Oh, Meg is my assistant editor over at Peter Piper Press. How do I do? How do I do? Well, usually, when you meet a brace of girls, one's nifty and the other's a dog, I have to assume you two never met before tonight to account for the good things coming in bunches. Yeah. That's <laughs> right, how was Stu? As Toots, oh. beer bartender, beer. Are we on the horse yet? Yeah. I was just telling Dylan that he should send some of his minor poems to this duchess over in Istanbul. She's paid great money, and she has no taste. She buys labels off of cans and prints them. Oh, uh, uh, I'll have a, a small glass of mulled wine. Do you mull your wine here? You can mull it. Mull me some wine. <laughs> I'm a man who's broken his leg. Are you still going to have uh, Dylan Reed at Ohio State? Bob teaches at Ohio State. Yes, Angus, you always sound like you're emceeing something. Yes, <laughs> Dylan is coming to, well, to meet the girls in my poetry classes. But at the moment, <laughs> I'm consumed with self-pity. Or is it Weltschmerz? I may never walk again. But I'm in intolerable pain. What's the doctor say happened to you? Well, he calls it a sprained ankle, but what the hell do doctors know about medicine? Uh, bartender, four double scotches! I'm running out of time! You have to read, remember? I don't have to do anything I don't want to do. I can read live. How exceptional! Well, I'm not exceptional. Ordinary people, I generally hit it off with ordinary people, because I'm one of them, and they sense it immediately. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm only a poet by accident. I don't have any emotions that other people don't ha have. Isn't that right, Angus? Slow down, Dylan. <laughs> I asked you a civil question. You're right. Isn't that right, Maddox? Hell no. You're a man with two heads. Any good drunk such as I can spot a man with two heads. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, what the hell happened to my drink? Where's my I dropped your drink. Oh, oh, hello. You had a million. <laughs> I want more. And more then, drinks. Let's blow the joint, Dylan. You do it the YMHA in less than an hour. No, I like it here in the horse. I'm very fond of everyone here. I'm fond of you, Angus, and I'm fond of you. And I am fond of you, and I... Why have you drawn back from me, madam? Do I disgust you? I'm not fond of you. You've got a poker up your ass. Didn't anyone ever tell you that? You've got a smug, hard, Salem bitch look about you. Are you a lesbian by any chance? Hail to thee, lead weight, bird thou never wert. I'm going to squeeze your boobs. Stay oh. Well, slap my face. I dare say I've got it coming. Well? Don't do that again. No doubt you 
feel I've grown trifle too familiar. But I intend to die before I'm 40, and I wouldn't want to miss <laughs> anything. <laughs> miss Stewart, your tits are couplets. Stand up and show us your villanelle. <laughs> Dylan, have some black coffee. No. Oh. You've got to read tonight, Dylan, and there's a piece of change riding on. I'll be brilliant, I'll be brilliant. Where shall we two meet again? Well, I'll see the party later. Great, where's the party? You're all invited to a party. It is a private party. Everybody's going to take out his privates. Beep, beep. Dylan! <laughs> My dear boy, we don't do that. It's not being done, you mean? <laughs> Another drink! <laughs> Take it easy, Dylan. There'll be plenty of booze afterwards at the party. Oh, at the wonderful party in my honor. I deserve it. I come along once every thousand years. I'm unique. I'm a unique eunuch. I'm the only iniquitous unique eunuch that can play Alexander's ragtime band on his own tin balls with his own long leather dong. <laughs> <laughs> Did you know I was a happily married man? Well, it doesn't bother me if it doesn't bother you. Black coffee, please. Can we have some black coffee, please? To Catelyn. My Catelyn. <laughs> I love Catelyn. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> she was an extraordinary dancer. Pretty as a princess on top of a Christmas tree. I ruined her career. She was a top model for Augustus John. She draws very well, and she writes better than I do. Oh, wait. I have a letter. Dylan is choking to death in there. He's 
says he can't breathe and he's spitting up blood. We'll pick up my doctor and move. Call him. Levinson, 57th Street. I don't think it's serious. No food. Levinson! Levinson! Who's the guy this bus is all about? Oedipus Rex. Killed his father, married his mother. Jesus. <laughs> what a goddamn waste. stage door yet. But he was right behind me in the cab. You don't suppose he thought it was the YMCA, do you? <laughs> what are we going to do? I don't know. We're 45 minutes late now. You're in charge. Angus. What do you mean? They stopped off to see a doctor. Is he sick? Drunk. Angus swore it wouldn't take more than five minutes. What do you want to do? Die? You shouldn't have let him out of your sight. I shouldn't have taken this job. I'm a poet. I'm not an entrepreneur. Did you just tell that audience and here he is? And here he is, Mr. Dylan Thomas. Applause, pause, nothing. Have you got a whole tour yet ahead of you? Well, it depends on tonight. It depends on whether or not he can come through. It's the result board we worship, right? Monster or freak, idiot or genius. What have you done for us tonight? That's what they say in the marketplace. That's what the lady says on her back in bed. That's what the gentleman says when he shakes your hand. Come through or be damned. Why don't you call it off? No, I won't. I won't. She's here! We hit every red light in route. Come on. You're introduced. You'll never make it. Dylan, you're on. I'm going out there and cop out. You'll do nothing of the kind, Mr. Mary. Beer, somebody get me some beer. There's hot coffee for you. There isn't any beer, Dylan. No, I got him some beer. He asked me to in the cab. Bless you, my true blue Annabella Bonacula. <sighs> I'll call it off. What's the sense? No, I can do it. I'm fine. Where are my poems? Where's the podium? Somebody point me towards the damn Dylan, thing. forget it. Nothing's that important. I'll be... I'll be all right if I can just reach the podium. I'll be brilliant, I promise. John, damn you, if you step out there, I'll be right alongside you and you're going to look like a bloody arse. Dylan, you can't do Relax, that. John. You look harried and careworn. my first poem, I should like to read a poem whose title is its first line. In my craft or solemn art. In my craft or solemn art, exercised in the still night when only the moon rages and the lovers lie abed with all their griefs in their arms. I labor by singing light, not for ambition or bread, or the strut and trade of charms on the ivory stages, but for the common wages of their most secret heart. Not for the proud man apart from the raging moon I write on these spindrift pages, nor the towering dead with their nightingales and psalms, but for the lovers, their arms round the griefs of the ages, who pay no praise for wages, nor heed my craft or art.
they ate him up tonight. <laughs> yes, it's the greatest last minute recovery act since 1932. <laughs> You're leaving me. Yes, John, congratulations. Did you get a chance to talk to Dylan? No, he's been far too busy racing around, blowing down the dickies of every girl at the brawl. But he's not like that all the time. I'm sure not. He must sleep sometime. <laughs> Come, let me get you a cab. No, thanks. With Catherine Ann Porter. I see her now. Catherine Ann Porter, you can't escape a Welshman's wonder. Catherine Ann Porter, I adore your short stories. Pale horse, pale rider. Ah, oh, just for that, I shall lift you up to the stars where you belong. Catherine oh! oh! Ann Porter, you're oh! taking shoulders of the ordinary woman right in the world. Off we go from roof to roof. I'm fresh out of white charges. Are you just going to sit there and laugh? Uh huh. Well, somebody has to rescue Catherine. It's a Marx Brothers movie, Angus. It's a Salvador Dali stepping off the canvas. Oh, and all over the academic literary world, the hair will be let down this year, and heels will kick, and dresses will catch in zippers, and banana peels shall strew the sidewalks, and pins shall. Pop balloons and beer shall drop from clouds, and people shall cry because we die, and laugh because we're born. And you and I, Angus Marius, you sycophant, shall have the book dust blasted off of us and be like kids again. Oh, dear God, I have to call Boston. And I'm potted.
anybody's out there especially to meet you. Dick and Benny, they invited the entire faculty. How'd I do tonight, entrepreneur? Well, you put Harvard College in your pocket. A handsome sum, indeed. <laughs> Dylan, did you remember to mail Llewellyn's school tuition money? Yes, yes. No, no, Dylan, just just look, look in your pockets. It's in, the, it's in the blue envelope that I, I made out and stamped A for you. blue envelope. I carried it in front of my nose all day yesterday. John, he's been humiliated before when I didn't have it or forgotten. I wouldn't let that happen again. Just because if it didn't go out yesterday, you know, they'll toss him out of school. And I know, I know. Just because Kat wrote you not to trust me is no reason to play dead mother. I mailed the bloody blue envelope. Could you not? I'm sorry. Come on back to the party. Not yet, not yet. Brought your drink. I don't want it. Put it down someplace. <coughs> Thought you wanted to see the midnight show with the old Howard. Shame on you. The party's in your honor out there, you know. I'm sure it is. Tell them in there I'm asleep. Or drunk. Or dizzy. Or dead. Not up to having my trouser cups kissed tonight. It reminds me of Llewellyn and Cullum, my boys. My poor boys. It reminds me of me when I was a boy. I was afraid of the dark. Sit down. It's nice here. How'd you get in here? I heard him crying. Nothing worth bothering his parents with. We had a bit of a talk and a laugh. Facts of life and a dirty joke. How old is he? Three. The age of wisdom. To believe in fairies and to be not quite yet toilet trained. <laughs> he asked me to tell him a bedtime story. I gave him my best reading in weeks. I wish he didn't. Oh, and what poem did you read, Dylan, to a three-year-old boy? Not one of my own, but one of my favorites, and the story of my life. Bar Bar Black Sheep, Happy Winnie Wool. Is that the story of your life, Dylan? Yes, every last word of it. Baba Black Sheep refers, of course, to me, who am the black sheep of my family, mankind. The Baba is the comment, the point of view. Have you any wool is the request that life makes of poets. Have you any long rainbow strands of woolly thought to be woven into the dense and lovely fabric of poems, which are the ferventest of prayers by which men praise God, and this is slapdash even continually lost and bound and lost to last. To which I answer up, very polite and eager, yes, sir, yes, sir. That's being affirmative, positive. Three bags full, that's bragging. <laughs> it's probably only two bags, or a bag and a half of talent to spend, of wit to squander, of love to give. And who to to give it? Why, the answer's almost immediate. One for my master, God. One for my dame, cat. Best looking dame I know. One for the little boy that lives down the lane. That's me. A long away once upon days. The lane is memory. That winded, winding, wound up, wounded, wondrous, winning thing. The bag for myself is probably the bag that I don't have. The brag bag. But in its place, the story offers me consolation that there's no end to it. The little boy lives, lives, lives. He never has to die. He may be a black sheep and all that, but he gives everything he's got to give away to others to serve their needs. So he gets to live forever, forever for it. In his bag of poems, John. In his bag of poems. I never knew the specific meaning to that verse before. Oh yes, that's what it's about. <laughs> Listen to it, you'll hear how clear it is when you're in the know. <clears throat> bar, bar, black sheep, have you any wool? Yes, sir, yes, sir, three bags full. One for my master, one for my dame, and one for the little boy that lives down the lane. <laughs> the curious thing, you know, here I am, Having truly arrived at the height of my gift, with all the craft at my fingertips, knowing exactly what to do, to say exactly what's to be said, just as I've run out of the drive to say it. 
I'll tell you what that's like. That's like all the good fairies around the cradle and the one malevolent hag that lowers a crooked finger that curdles the cream of the blessings. That one malevolent hag that cries across my bunting, if this child is going to grow up, this child is going to grow old and sing no more. And it fills me with rage. It fills me with rage. The home of family entertainment, whose motto is anything can happen, proudly presents its star attraction in her world-renowned, inspiring, exotic dance, Miss Thelma Wonderland. myself to the fishes before I reach Wales. Disappointing Llewellyn's what destroys me. Oh, how could I have let him down? I love him so. Here he was, humiliated to tears, being tossed out of school for no money. And here I was, living it up, lapping it up with the bloody money it's still in my pocket. Oh, God. John Malcolm Brinning, I am such a failure as a human being that it's something fierce. No, I looked this morning when I packed. It's all gone. Oh, God. There's $300 left. I kept it from you. It's all rolled up in your shaving kit. It was supposed to be a kind of secret bonus, but I guess it's your whole net profit now. Didn't you trust me, damn it? No, damn it, I did it. Oh, thank God. 
<laughs> My dear friend, forever bringing... You have to get me back here. I have to come back. You're my man in America. I don't think you should too soon. It's been a brilliant tour, but for you personally... I'll write here next time. I'll hold on to the money. It will be different. I may visit you in Wales in the fall. We'll, we'll talk about yes, it next. Yes, yes. Come to Wales. You'll meet Catherine. Oh, she'll love you. You must come. Stick takes forever to carry me. Lose weight. Hey, you too, you filthy dog. <laughs> I'm right. Well, John Malcolm Brennan, my host. Say the good word. Ba ba black sheep. You may pass. A favor. Favor. Hand me that brown paper bag in the corner, like a good friend. Sure, what's in it? Nibbles, sweets, drops, I think. with the sound of my voice. 
You're never coming back there, never again. I am, for the money, for the freedom of the money, free of my debts, and drowned in the monies, so I can concentrate. Sit, sit. That's why I'm anxious, I'm ready, I'm desperate. Jesus, Captain, poetry! They've spoiled you rotten. You're dissipated and fat and flabby and sick to your soul. Listen to you, you egotist. I'm spitting blood. I've had two blackouts. I've been running. I'm so tired. I'm so tired. Come, you're going to bed now. To have sex! To sleep! <laughs> Didn't you have enough sex in America? Enough liquor? Enough adulation? What do you have to be the bloody Pope still? Yes! You don't understand. I'm as famous as God. I told them all about you. I told them how you're as pretty as a princess on top of a Christmas tree. Listen, I'm sorry for not writing Listen so Listen to me. I... You're never going back there. They've had you, and you've had them. What do you mean? Stop. For one minute, Dylan, stop. Don't you know what you've been through? Yes, I do. It's no good for me, Kat. It's just will kill me. I don't want to die. Oh, thank God. I'm so alone, Kat. I'm so lonely. Don't let me go back. Don't let me go! <laughs> them are coming. Good luck to America. <laughs> Angus, I did promise to have lunch with him, but I am certainly not going to have lunch with him with his wife here. I don't care what you say he expects. Vernon! Yeah. <laughs> Hang on. Wait till I adjust the phone here. <laughs> yeah, no, I broke my arm. Uh, don't listen. J no, I'd be delighted to have Dylan again, but I want your word, John, that he shows up this time. Oh, by the time he showed up last time, half of my classes had graduated. <laughs> Jesus, I have made a terrible mistake, Angus. I mean, I never thought he'd come back. I got married. <laughs> <laughs> you heard me, Angus Marius. <laughs> I want to reserve three tables for the White Horse Tavern for October 10th. I know you don't reserve tables, but it's a party for Dylan. Right. Didn't we pay for the glassware last time? <laughs> this is entirely different. His wife will be with him. Mrs. Dylan Thomas here, who's this? Time Magazine? What do you want? <laughs> we just walked through the door of our hotel. He's lying down and can't be disturbed. What do I think of you? I think you're all too bloody pleasant, and I don't trust you as far as I can throw you. And if I had my way, we wouldn't be here. Brennan! Angus, I'm, I'm calling you from the White Horse Tavern. It's a wonderful party, wonderful party. Kat is just enjoying herself immensely, but is Dylan with you? Well, then I've lost him. Meg, it's Dylan Thomas. I'm back in America, and you're in the phone book. Do you want to have lunch with me? No. Oh, it's only four o'clock in the morning. 
Listen, I'm going to be very sick, and if the cat sees me, she'll get scared and go home. But I've got a half a bottle of booze to go. I'm, uh, I'm on the corner of uh, Bleecker and Sixth Avenue. Oh, it's starting to rain. Come, pick me up for lunch. <laughs> in here. Charlie's aunt. <laughs> Cat, was it Cat? Angus. He's going to call Cat until you're conked out of his place sleeping it off. Good, no sense dropping our tobacco butts in good liquor. No point in mentioning that I'm here alone with you at an ungodly hour in a private room without my clothes. What do you suppose I'm hinting at? I suppose I'm hinting at an orgy and I don't even feel like an orgy. I wouldn't know what to do with an orgy if I had one. Still, if I don't even hint at it, the sense of waste depresses me for weeks. <laughs> Thus, the clown admits his nose is large. Put your duds on, I'll make you some tea. Tea? That's made with ordinary tap water, isn't it? Can't you make us something antiseptic? You can't stay here, Dylan. Haven't you got an apparatus that could open up temporarily for me? It's not convertible. Come on, Dylan. I'm a big girl, you're a big boy, uh, and you were married. Yes, happily. Happily married. Three children. You're rejecting me. Never kill you. Oh, I thought you were going to undertake my reformation. Uh, lost cause, change of mind. Oh, change of heart. Dress. Without my shorts. Well, notice. I hate to tell you. You're a genius. You've got till tomorrow to plan an explanation. Angus is expecting you at his place tonight. Oh, stay, stay. A lousy conversation to myself tonight. You don't even have to close your eyes. I can do it under the roof. <laughs> Oops. Houdini, the escape mm. artist. Why on earth did you come back to America, Dylan? Why did I come back to America? Well, I've never told this to a living soul, but the truth of the matter is that the British government has built a guided missile site right next to my boathouse in Wales. 
No, it's completely true. You can't tell what moves you is the spirit or the blast off. Impossible uh, conditions to write in. I write, the ground is shaking and the ground is shaking. Would you be married at your own funeral, Dylan? Impossible, I'll be late to it. <laughs> no, the real reason is I need money. I've just discovered it's the current mode of exchange. You'll blow every penny you make and you know it. You want to be my business manager? Isn't John? Only for the tour. Cat hit the roof. Mm -hmm. You are Houdini, Dylan, the escape artist. I'm a highly concentrated person that adores distraction. <laughs> Escaping what? You won't let that go, will you? Escaping. Give me a cigarette. Escaping responsibility. One is always escaping responsibility. To cat? To internal revenue. Please, Dylan. Please be serious. Calm down off the rostrum, level with the lady in the balcony, escaping responsibility to... Poetry! <coughs> I haven't written a word of it in a dog's age. Maybe only 1% of a poet's life is poetry. The other 99% of the time he's just a normal human being. But he knows he's only saving up for the 1% when the magic happens. So he plays pig to supply manure to grow the flowers in. <laughs> My collected poems are out. Two dollars and fifty cents will buy any acneed student of modern verse my entire output. The input I put into that output, my entire life. And when it comes to two dollars and fifty cents, I think I'm overpaid. <laughs> Still, not bad for something you'd have done for nothing. Selling like hotcakes. My entire life is selling like hotcakes. If sales keep up over the years, I may make $5,000 for my pain. Who asked you to be a poet? I'm not complaining. It's not bad for something I've done for nothing. But I am filled with wonder these days because my collected poems are out and I'm still kicking. Why, it's like I've been given an entire second life. And what shall I do with it, having it now to do all over again? Dylan? I'll make you a deal. Good. Go to bed with me, and I'll autograph your copy of my collected poems. You do have a copy, don't you? Yes, I have a copy. Let me tell you what to do with your life. Like a schoolmaster, and I'll take 10% of the satisfaction. Aren't I living my life correctly, schoolmaster? You aren't living your life at all. I'm living it to the hill. Oh, no. Not your life. You're only living the poet's life. Stop trying to write poetry. It's not the end of the world. Write plays. Write an opera. Write a film. Write your adventures in America. Cut more recordings of your readings and build yourself an annuity. Let your writing go out and work for you instead of having to stand up in Des Moines and kill yourself for $50 a show. Do you have any stocks? Real estate? Insurance? Oh, Dylan. You don't live your life. You live some image you once got of yourself as the bad boy genius skidding downhill to a splashy crack up. I tell you, the magic will come back. If you take a little of the terror of no money, and hangovers, and sex, unlimited and indiscriminate, and you throw those things in the trash can because they are worthless and you are valuable. You want to read what they're going to write about you when you're dead. But you may not be able to do that. <coughs> I mean, whoever guaranteed you a private resurrection? Christ. Well, if you're plumping for sainthood, you haven't any right to drag Cat and three children down that old road of agony and endurance. She drags me, I tell you. She drags me. I'm only living up to how she chooses to see me. And she chooses to see you how you chose to see yourself 20 years ago. Every damn silly thing that woman does or says is only to match you. Outrage for outrage. And I hate that. Well, then how happily married can you be? I lied. I'm not happy. She's not happy. It's impossible to live with her. It gets more impossible every day. I detest the way we are together, and I detest the way I become when I'm with her. 
I'm tired to death of it. And I can't write! I don't know whose fault it is anymore. Both of us now. Maybe she'd be better off without me. Yes. I love her. I love her as I love burning coals and bits of colored glass and bright thumbtacks and snakes unscotched in pits, but I can't walk barefoot on them anymore. My Hindu kidhood's gone. It's gone, shed like a lizard's skin, and I feel newborn and tenderfooted. More so mortal, perhaps. Maybe it wouldn't be such a terrible thing as I used to think it would be, a soft birth wall to wall in my young old age. Why don't you try to tell her that? I will. I will. One night Maddox said you have a death wish, Dylan. Baloney. You believe I have anything like that, like a death wish? When you go on the tour, if you want to talk to me, you can call me. Reverse the charges. My unofficial business manager. Well, I suppose I'd better leave. Angus isn't expecting you, Dylan. It's raining out. I have a birthday coming up. Is this my birthday present? <laughs> <laughs> there are needs in this world that have nothing to do with love. And marriages that never get recorded in the courthouse. Happy birthday, Dylan. successful. Dylan's collected poems coming out last month and going so well. That's a big help, isn't it? I'm going to keep a diary of the tour and sell it to Angus Marius so I can make us some real money. Can't trust Dylan. He's got a perennial hole in his pocket. I want to take him and the children and myself off to Mallorca. We're all in need of a vacation from struggling. Oh, look. Here's an Augustus John. 1936 portrait of a lady. Huh. <laughs> Listen, why don't we go back down to the main lobby? Dylan and Angus should be turning up any minute now. What is it, Captain? It's me. John, it's me, 16 years ago. Oh, yes, of course it's you. Too late. You didn't know me. I'm like the cliff back in Wales, the boathouse backs to <coughs> weathered to the edge of collapse. Well, doesn't everyone's youth gets hung in the Metropolitan Museum of Art? <laughs> Will you be my friend, Cat? Brennan. I'll be yours if you'll be mine. 
Can I count on you when it counts? I guess that's what I mean by friend. Do you know what I mean by counts? I mean when all the young, predatory American witches flop down in indelicate positions at his feet. Are you going to help me beat them off? Or play bystander whose business it suddenly isn't? Because I know who I am. And I am the life of him. The unhappy, quarreling, domesticated, but very necessary life of him. What I mostly fear is a particular woman in mink or blue jeans or a tailored su suit who will be the death of him. Well, that can't happen, Cat. Why turn my back and I'll count it? Dylan's as susceptible to romance as a weeping widow. When he's keyed up like the readings make him, he aches to unwind. His little excursions in London over the years never concerned me. But the bloody man's at a dangerous age in a country of hospitable vampires. Cat, I swear to you, I couldn't be more opposed to Dylan's uh, promiscuity if I stood on my head, but I'm not I asking you to stand on your head or your butt. I'm asking you to lend me a hand or to point out smoke before my house goes up when I turn my back. Well, I don't think, Cat, that I, I want to be a, a tattletale or have to insert myself between Dylan and every little arsonist that turns up for an autograph like a chaperone. Then don't ask me to be your friend. My God, you're just as bad as he is. Of course. Don't you know I'm the woman Dylan would have been if Dylan had been a woman? That's what I've made of me. And it has taken three children and the aging years, and you'll never know. And nobody, nobody is going to take my place without a fight. Wake up! Wake up! Not if we're still in Texas. Wake up! The bloody alarm clock has stabbed us in the back! I forgot to set it. Jesus, Dylan! Get up! It's Tuesday! We've got to get out of here and get on a damn bus by six! Where are we in the name of God? Uh, we're in, uh, uh, in Houston! No, we were in Houston last week! Uh, well, then we're in Austin. They're all alike. <laughs> oh, shit! I stopped my. So, I hate America. Will you get up? It's Tuesday. There's going to be 4,000 people at 250 ahead at the Municipal Auditorium in New Orleans tomorrow night, and you're lying there laboring like you thought you were the Queen of Sheba. When I go to hell, they're going to make me lie forever on this mattress. Holy <laughs> God, my wristwatch isn't going. What does yours say? 10 past 5. <sighs> Great. And not ticking. Great! <laughs> Me first in the bathroom! Well, you don't have half as much to do as I do in the... Oh, fine. I'll stop packing and shaving here. Uh. Uh. Uh, Catlin, I'll never understand why every time we move into a new hotel room, you've got to unpack us over ten drawers. Well, I have to make a nest, don't I? Oh, yes. Our nest in Wales is a bloody sight to behold. I swear you do it just to drive me out of my mind. My God, what a beard I've got. No sleep, no sleep. We never get any sleep on this bloody tour. Say, this is Tuesday, isn't it? Well, last night was Monday night, still, and it should be Tuesday. Of course. Hey, it's dark out. There's a big 
peculiar lack of light out today, like a tropical storm brewing. Probably still Monday night. Yes. Yes, of course. I feel as if it were. <laughs> oh, I see. It's dawn. We've, we've tons of time. <laughs> yes, I can see the sun there rising in the west. <sighs> Well, that was some party they gave us last night, <laughs> after the reading. If you hadn't thrown the book at me, I would never have thrown them off. Worst of it was, after we uh, slammed the door and told them all to go to hell, having to uh, go back and borrow the cab fare. Well, it was that and not have enough for even a bus to New Orleans. <laughs> Dan Brennan sending us that ridiculous wire. Lest we forget, huh. as if we couldn't manage to get ourselves from Dallas to New Orleans without being prodded like pigs every inch of the way. And then he didn't even send us a penny to get there with dirty Brennan. Dirty Brennan. He's kept a shamefully loose grip on this tour, is all I can say. You should have written him weeks ago. Ah, was that time to write letters? I'll call him after breakfast. Well, the tour is nearly over. We haven't a nickel to show for it. Things certainly are different this time with you along. It's worse. I didn't ship two hundred dollars worth of toys across the Atlantic Ocean. Oh, no, you shipped our dirty laundry from Chicago to San Francisco for forty dollars. I'd do it again. I don't want to go to New Orleans. I want to go home to Wales. Well, you listen to me, Kat. Our way of life is a nut house. I've seen a different way of life in my travels, and if you push me too far, I'll have to take it. It doesn't include you. <laughs> oh, Kat, you're the only girl for me, am I? Love has nothing to do with it. I've got to support you, even if that means having to leave you to do it. Now, New Orleans, We'll make it up to us. There's profit there. Then there's Washington, D.C. I'll go home without you. Who is she? You don't understand. We don't have the fare. We can't even afford to get out of the country. I've got such a headache. Well, so have I. Look, don't bother folding everything. Just shove it in. never understand, without so much as an added Kleenex, how the devil these bags get thicker and thicker every time we pack them up again. <laughs> Come sit on a suitcase with me. I don't want to sit on a suitcase. Well, why are you crying, Kat? <laughs> don't cry, Kat. I'll, I'll take care of you. I'm at a great turning point in my life. It's just not easy to adjust for a fool like me, but I'm trying as hard as I can. This isn't why I'm crying, Dylan. Then why are you crying, Kat? I'm listening, Kat. Because the sun doesn't rise in the west. <laughs> Night. Not so fast. It's, it's probably just eight or eight thirty. We'll uh, wire Bryn in for money, and we'll take a plane. Hello, room service. Yes. What time do you have? Eight thirty. Excellent. Hold the phone. I would like to order dinner for two. Now, Cat, what would delight your sea-changed palate? Strictly American cuisine, of course. Will it be a deboned, defeathered, defrosted hot dog under glass, washed <laughs> down with a jumbo-sized paper cup of fermented Coke? Or will it be Chinese food flown in from Pittsburgh? Till then ask room service what day it is while you're at it. Room service? Yes, this is Tuesday evening, of course. It's Wednesday evening. 
It's Wednesday evening at 8.30. No, it can't be that. I've got 4,000 people waiting for me in municipal auditorium in New Yes, I'd like to speak to a manager. Dylan, give up. Hang up. Never mind. And say what? Go home? We're a thousand miles to the west of you? Shall we call Brennan? Oh, poor Brennan. Poor Brennan. Well, there's one consolation. Mm. Things can't get worse. I don't know. There's still Washington, D.C. At least we've got time to get there. <laughs> That's the spirit. Set your watch. <laughs> Patrons, Elena. Oh, well, I hope he likes me. Elena, he hopes you like him. Angus! We seem to have acquired an uninvited guest. Your assistant is her implausible story. <laughs> <laughs> Who's watching this door? Who cares? Every spring I have a compulsion to see a cherry blossom. <laughs> Aren't you going to introduce me? Why do I have to always be the one? All right. Meg Stewart, Mr. and Mrs. Antone. Terrific addition. I, I'll make sure Charles gets you some champagne. Or Miss Stewart. Hold on. I shall return. As was said by only the greatest man this country ever bred and then kicked in the pants. Who could that be, I wonder? Whenever Mr. Antone's use of the third person masculine gender is in question, it is General Douglas MacArthur. Sure, shoot me. You dress? This old thing, yes. <laughs> you know Mrs. Antone's prepared to give Dylan some money. Oh, boss, you really don't trust me. I have spies. I have radar. I have hidden cameras. Do you also know I've spoken to him three times this week and called it off? One time calls it off, three times shows you don't mean it. Worry about Catelyn, more to the point. I also thought you were Catelyn's friend. Wouldn't you be surprised if I turned out in being an influence in making their marriage work? I would raise both my eyebrows, Meg, for the first time in my life. What does Dylan have to do for the money? Just be friendly, and we're all going to look the other way. Nest pot? So friendly, we're all going to look the other way. Meg, you got here. <coughs> Great. <gasps> I wired Kat to see if she thought I might come for Friday's party and Saturday's reading. That was thoughtful. I told her she could come, Angus. She may meet a rich, bloody politician in Washington, D.C. What is Dylan up to up there? Fussing over his bow tie won't be helped. Shot all his time criticizing me as to how I'm turned out. He's a little nervous tonight. Kat, you're beautiful. Exquisite. I don't know why, but I've never gotten over thinking a party means something wonderful, unexpected, thrilling is going to happen. Well, Don Juan will be down and on. Now, Kat? I agree. I agreed to look the other way. I agreed not to drink. Do I also have to agree to be agreeable? Get out of the way. I'm coming down the banister. Don't tell me he's been. Since lunch. No, I don't slide as well as I used to. <laughs> You're overloaded, that's why. Unkind, unkind. I'm in full possession of myself. I am simply braced to meet the occasion. Dylan, Meg is here. Yes. Uh, hello, Meg. Hello, Dylan. Well, 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 shall we all go join the merry throng? I can hear the tinkle of ice and the rending rip of reputations. Well, Kat, how do you want to go in there? On my arm or over my shoulder? Put it badly, Meg. Put it 
certainly uh, What a bloody fool I am, dear Ed. How unworthy of your rathood is my naivete. I don't know what you're talking about. I think I'm going to have one drink. It won't kill me. You listen to me, cat. If you lose us our one chance to get the money to take us to Mallorca and patch together our poor marriage to get, I'll, I'll never forgive you. We'll be through. Because I made two killing, profitless trips to America and I can't do it again. I mean, this tonight is the straw that can break the camel's back. I'm doing this for us. I've introduced you to three people in there already, and where are you? Gangway, please, I'm gonna get my motion picture camera, see if I can catch some footage of Dylan. Oh, hello, Dylan, I'll, I'll be right down. Hello, Mrs. Thomas. Are you 
Dunning Daddy Warbucks for the money. Why not? But Ellen is practically in the palm of our hand. Not if I can help it. How many children do you have again? Three. Oh, that's a lot of shoes. <laughs> oh, hello, Angus. Isn't this a posh party? Isn't this a far cry from my boathouse in Wales, Brennan? You want to see my boathouse? Brennan, how do you like to see the shores of the Potomac by moonlight? I've seen it. Oh, Brennan, don't be such a sour ball. It's a party. That's a spirit. Mrs. Thomas, you are an extraordinarily beautiful woman. Well, I'm glad somebody noticed. <laughs> John, come join the party, dear boy. I must be five drinks up on you. Dylan, I've just spoken to Mr. Antwell about getting the money for you, and he's considering it. That's a lot. Too bad you can't tell him it's self-protection. That is, if I can ever get her alone to bring the subject up. Have you seen Kat? Oh, she just went out to look at the Potomac with Mr. Anton. Oh, now, Dylan. She's higher than a kite. If that old goat lays its foul fiscal fingers on her, I'll bust his pump his head open. Easy, Dylan, easy. I'll, I'll go join them. Just don't be rash. Hang on to your purpose and stay on your feet. It's a war of nerves. The bloody woman fights me at every turn. Oh, you don't make it a bed of roses for her, Dylan. I'll show her. Get out of my way. I'll end it tonight once and for all. You've got an empty glass, Dylan. Dylan, why don't you sit down with your empty glass and let five minutes go by without pouring alcohol into your bloodstream? You've got to be clear-headed, don't I? Please. And I'll go catch up with Kat. She loves you, Dylan. Oh, is Dylan Thomas at this party? No. I crashed the wrong party, thanks. Oh, you don't know where he is, do you? He's back home in Wales. Isn't he going to read tomorrow night in Washington? They're using a recording. His wife is going to stand up and mouth the words. Will that work? You'll never notice the difference. <laughs> Excuse me. There you are, Percy Miss Shelley. Alone at last, and by the steps of the Library of Congress, I imagine. You need a little pot of gold out here. How much? Five thousand. I can pay it back by, well, within a year, and absolutely. You can pay it back any time you can. I will write you a check. When? I keep losing you. Now? Where? How do you mean, where? I mean, we ought to slip away to someplace private. Someone might misconstrue. Where would be good? My bedroom. That'd be good. We can lock the door. Two adult people can lock a door without there being <laughs> anything more to it than that? I admire the pants off you. I like you, Eleanor, too. I'm terribly taken with you. Would you like me if I didn't have a penny in the world? Without question. I'm so glad you said that. Come. Eleanor, hey, leave me alone with Dylan here for a minute. I want to talk with him. Hey, Henry, just when he was flirting with me, outrageously. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dylan, uh, rain check. Uh, check. Dylan, uh, Brennan, uh, let slip your little barracks, financial straits, and so forth. He was not alive, was he? No, I do need some cash fairly quickly. I can't make head of tales of your poems, but I, I do like mildly the, the, the way you read them. What's your politics over there? Politics? Uh, you know, Tories versus Whigs, or <laughs> whatever's going on nowadays. My politics. I see what you mean. Anti-Stalinist. How do you mean? I mean, I'm in favor of the workers as opposed to the exploiting bosses. I'm in favor of curing the ill, feeding the hungry, destroying all armaments everywhere, and tearing down the borders between people. I'd also like to do away with money, and do you know a nice Negro girl I could marry off my son to? Don't talk of a communist sympathizer! How the hell do you even get a passport in this country? All the Democrats in Congress got together and snuck me in. Yeah, I believe it. No one of your bro. God damn, where's Brennan? Where? No, where's that marriage, fella? I am not drinking too much, Brennan, your spoiled sport. Brennan J. Henry's hunting high and low for you. Did you talk? We had a very pleasant chat about politics. Oh my god. <laughs> I've got a marvelous idea. Why don't you get the filthy money from Meg? Then you won't have to split your focus. Why are you staring at me? What the hell ever happened to that girl I met in Augustus John's studio that day? I think I'm going to dance. You can't dance. I can dance. You used to love to watch me dance. I have reminded certain people of Isadora Duncan from time to time. Uh, Isadora Duncan too goddamn drunk to dance? <laughs> <laughs> Where the fuck do 
you think you're going to get him? I'll tear her hair out! The filthy mouth has to pay belly! The money was to be for Mallorca. You forgot the purpose of it. I'll kick you down these stairs, Kat. Try it! I can beat you up, Dylan, and you know it! Oh! You whore! Come on, what are you? Come <laughs> on! Oh. You son of a bitch! attention to me. I write poems and I read them out loud. I lie, I cry, I laugh, I cheat, I steal when I can. I must have an iron constitution as I've been abusing it for years to an extent which would kill a good horse in a matter of hours. I love people, rich and poor people, dumb as well as smart people, people who like poetry, people who have never heard of poetry. I'm life's most devoted, most passionate, most shameless lover. I must be. And I like a good party and a good time, and lots of applause and pats on my back and pots and hats full of Jack, which I then like to spend without stinting. Comforts make me comfortable. An ache in my tooth, nails in my shoe, and grit in my eye do not. I've lived in an age when men have turned Jews into soap, and I've been, ever since those days, a wee bit confused about the godly nature of the human creature. But I'm not as confused as anyone I ever met or heard of, because I'm me, and I know me. I've sung a few songs in 39 years just for the pleasure of singing, but I've come to a point in my life when I think I've got something to say. And I think it has something to do with having the guts to thumb your nose at the social shears that clip the wings of the human heart in this mushrooming, cancerous, complex age. I'm hot for fireworks in the dull of night. I want the factual killing world to go back to fancy kissing for its livelihood. I'm about to write an opera with Stravinsky, a play on my own, my first, called Under Milkwood, and I've been asked to play the lead in a play on Broadway. Things are looking but I've been spitting a lot of blood and blacking out more often than I'm used to, and I think I had a touch of the DTs last week as I started seeing li little things that aren't there. Mice, for example. Miss Meg Stewart, my friend, suggested that I come see you, Doctor, as it's entirely possible and not a little ironic. Now the things are finally looking up, that I'm dying. Thomas, you're lucky you're not dead. My God. Wet brain. That's the popular term for it. An insult to the brain from too much alcohol for too long a time. The little blood vessels in and around the gray matter are shorting, like an electric circuit. Those are your blackouts. But too many more of them pop and you've had it. 
You mean I'm exploding by degrees like a star? <laughs> Do you really want to live, Mr. Thomas? Yes. One would never know. You have a wife and three children. In Wales. My wife's gone back to Wales. Why don't you go home to them? No. Mr. Thomas, if you take one more drink, a small drink, a beer, a sip, you will have committed suicide as surely as if you jump off a cliff. How you want to play the game is up to you. Your life is in your hands. According to what I read in Time Magazine, you're reported to be the greatest lyric poet of the 20th century. Doesn't that obligate you? I'm not so good at obligations. Are you a great poet, Mr. Thomas? I don't know. I'm just me. I'm me. I shall never have such loving a year. Dylan, the auditorium's full up up there. I'm just reviewing these pages. Hello? Green in, I'll be right there. My right there. God, you swore you'd be all through writing in the afternoon I left for Boston. What have you been doing for two days? Brewing it, stewing it, putting in commas. Meg, uh, darling, another Coke for the good boy. Oh, you're really on the wagon, I see. Yes, yes, world of good for me. I'm a completely new chap. My arm is a pincushion from the doctor's needles. I have pills to take that were made for elephants, and I'm sick to death of Coca-Cola, but I'm alive after a fashion. How much has he got to go? How near done are you, Dylan? A few pages, a few pages. Look, why don't we just say for the purpose of the reading tonight that it's incomplete, and we find a good stopping spot when it's already done. No, got to finish. <clears throat> the natives are restless. Let them wait five minutes. The actors, though, Dylan, are pretty nervous upstairs. They know they're getting pages handed to them at the last second. They're all professional actors. They're going to have the pages in front of them on the rostrums. It's not a Broadway production. It's only a reading, and it's all one syllable words besides. I'm reading six parts per personally. Stop worrying. What's that? Stamping their feet. It's almost nine o'clock. Uh, John, go up and assure everyone that I am all present, judge sober, full of 16 hours of sleep from last night. I've only to write curtain and I'll be up and spouting at them. Oh, well, I'm not going to tell them things being written ten seconds before they hear it. Why not? Create a feeling of spontaneity. <sighs> I'll give a long introduction. Two minutes, Meg. Done or not. You'll be there. Tell them how I met my master and my mistress and have turned a new leaf. How can I help? Uh, uh, do you see a matchbook lying about here with two lines written on it? Oh. This one? No. It, it's the beginning of Reverend Eli Jenkins' sunset prayer, uh, just as the town is about to go to bed at the very end of the play. Uh, Hotel Algonquin. Uh, it was Minetta's I was in, I think. Having a glass of milk. Every morning when I wake, dear Lord, a little prayer I make. That's it. Um, every morning when I wake, dear Lord. Oh, damn it to hell, the pencil broke! Here, here's one nice and sharp. Where's the rest of the prayer? It's in my head somewhere. <laughs> oh, I can't do it. It takes too long. All right, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll do it. I'll give it in shorthand, go. Um, prayer I make. Um, oh, please to keep thy lovely eye on all poor creatures born to die. Good evening. There's more. You'll do it on the platform. Whether we lost the night or no, I'm sure is always touch Go. I'm sure is always touch and go. We are not holy, 
bad or good, we live our lives under new wood. Got it? Got it. Now, where's my opening pages? I had them. I left them in a cab the other day, and a blessed cabby found me out and returned them. Oh, here they are. Well, who spilled coffee on that? Is my tie straight? In terrible shape, they broke it. <coughs> Go. Make, make. What am I going to do at the party after, when everybody's drinking? You're going to be the famous man, Dylan. Sitting in the corner with a glass of soda water in his hand. Oh, God. Thank you, Meg. I think I've got a hell of a chance. on business and I trained out to see you. I've got to be back in New York for Christmas. Oh, don't come up. The house is a wreck. Let me get your coat. I'll take you to Brown's for a decent drink. Hurry up. Oh, get a little bit more on those branches there. He'll be angry we didn't wait for him, but that's just too bad. <laughs> Did he say where? If you mean is he at the horse, he might be. But if he is, he's sipping coke. That's law. I feel as if I hadn't seen him in a month of Sundays. I hope he understands. If he's gonna stay here the year round, I've gotta earn a living. Well, it's been a month of Sundays. Quiet, pasting the good reviews of Under Milkwood in the scrapbook. Eight hours beauty, lots of milk, Dickens, bar talk, and the only living alarm clock known to man, me. Terrific for him, Meg. Do the honors, would you? Since the man of the house is absent. Let's you, Catherine. So this is Dylan's corner of Wales, at last. That's the shack up there above the house where he scribbles himself off blind. How is the bloody man? Is he coming home for Christmas? Well, he's, you know, the good reading of Under Milkwood was a big springboard for him. Now there's offers for this, plans for that, the future's bright. He's not coming home for Christmas. Uh, but, surprise? Some very good tidings from Dylan. Open it. Open it. What's in it? One of Brennan's blue envelopes. It better be money. It's a check for a thousand dollars. Count the zeros. <laughs> What's the matter? A shock to the nervous system? Don't talk to me for a minute, please. I'm not as incompetent as Angus Marius thinks. You see that? <laughs> <laughs> Angus has gone to see Cat Wales. I removed a thousand dollars and sent it along with him. That should be welcome the expensive time of the year. Let's have eggnogs, shall we? You sit, grow a beard, take me a second. <laughs> Boy, we haven't seen him Dylan in a dog's age. I'd like 18 whiskeys, please. <laughs> Off the wagon, and a Coke. I just want to look. At 18 whiskeys. That's the world's record, you know. Boy, you an original. I'll bring them on. Can I loan you a very new handkerchief? I thought you'd be delighted as apple pie. Is he still at the Chelsea, or has he moved in with company? Meg, is Dylan still at the Chelsea? Absolutely! He's still on the register, Cat. There you go, Mr. Thomas. Take a good, long look. But don't jump in. Water's off. Right. So this is the way we're going to finish it in a warring absence? I don't know where he could 
could be. Well, here's to Dylan. Wherever he is, there are no tears. I'll buy that. Come now, Cat, no more tears. Blow your nose now. It's just a temporary alliance. It's probably going to do a lot of good. A bloody check is such a hollow wonder. Great eggnog. Listen, why don't we call the horse? I have to trust him, John. Then let me call. I want to be the drunkest man in the world. And the curious sense I'll never see him in the world again. Nonsense. This is John Malcolm Brennan. Guess who I'm looking for? He is. Please. He's there. I tell you, Kat, you'd be really extremely proud of him. He stopped drinking. He's a man who's coming into his own in every sense. Without me. Without me. No, I'm not here. We made a mistake. It's not here that I am anyway. Oh, we'll see if he seems sober. I don't want to get on with him, but if he's had a drink, we'll catch a cab down there immediately. Don't kill him, I said that. Yes. Let's go to Brown's and have a Christmas cheer. We'll drink to Dylan. What do you say? You look at the pyramids, I look at the Bible. Thank you. I don't believe him. Now he says it was somebody who looked like him. Oh my god. All right, let's get out of here. I'll just, I'll, I'll get my coat. All right. Oh, let me put on the Christmas tree lights. I know really he'll find a way to come back. Wales is his home. He loves presents. It's that little boy about them. That's how to look at it. Dylan knows what's best for him. Maybe I never should have invited him to America. Thirty-nine, twenty-nine, nineteen, ten. Christmas. Hit him with a snowball. Look at your footprints. People think they've been hippos here. Yeah. Merry Christmas. Jim and Dan and Jack and me. I wonder if the fishes ever get to see the snow. That's the brightest star. Over all of Wales. Good night. Father in heaven, Mother of God, bless, curse me now from that sad height. I love you. But I'm alone. Rage of the world. Half compromise, half lie. I'm coming home. <laughs> 